Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, it's a nice turnout. A beautiful day outside. It's uh, it's my great honor to set up the introduction for William Massey this afternoon. And I, I, I thought I would start off with uh, uh, looking backwards, maybe a hundred years, to see if we can't put this into some sort of context. Um, in order to have a productive discussion of digitally informed craft, we must look back to the Hull House in Chicago about a hundred years prior. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright gave a seminal address there to the Chicago Arts and Crafts Society on March 6th, 1901. And uh, he wrote a piece called The Art and Craft of the Machine. We've seen this in various places uh, throughout the century. And uh, Wright professes, as we work along our various ways, there takes shape within us, in some sort, an ideal, something we are to become, some work to be done. This, I think, is, is denied to very few, and we begin really to live only when the thrill of this ideality moves us in what we will to accomplish. In the years which we have devoted in my own life to working out in stummered materials a feeling for the beautiful, in the vortex of distorted complex conditions, a hope has grown stronger with the experience of each year, amounting now to a gradually deepening conviction that in the machine lies the only future of art and craft. As I believe, a glorious future. That the machine is, in fact, the metamorphosis of ancient art and craft. That we are at last face to face with the machine, the modern sphinx. Whose riddle the artist must solve if he or she would that art live. For this nature holds the key. For one, I promise, whatever God may be, to lend such energy and purpose as I may possess to help make that meaning plain, to return again and again to the task whenever and where need be. For this plain duty is thus relentlessly marked out for the artist in this, the machine age. The fire of many long honored ideals shall go down to ashes to reappear phoenix-like with new purposes. Now, let us learn from the machine. 100 years ago, 1901, Frank Lloyd Wright. William Massey is a poet of the kind suggested by Wright. 100 years since this Hull House lecture, we see these ideas manifest in Massey's body of work. Along those lines, William Massey has committed his practice to a productive exploration of the potential of these new computer-controlled machines in a search for the potential for a digital craft in architecture. William Massey received his Bachelor of Fine Arts at Parsons School of Design in New York and subsequently received a Master of Architecture from Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture. In 1903, he started his own company while simultaneously accepting a teaching position in the Graduate School of Architecture at Columbia University, where he was appointed as the Coordinator for Building Technologies Research. Currently, William Massey is the architect in residence and the head of architecture department at Cranbrook Academy of Art in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, and a tenured professor of architecture at Rensselaer Polytechnic in Troy, New York. He has taught at Montana State University in Bozeman, Montana, and Parsons School of Design in New York City. And at this point, I think it's appropriate for me to turn the microphone over to Paul Pizzello, who can give a little bit more of uh, a personal uh, introduction uh, for, for Bill, because uh, he, was, he was there when Bill arrived at Cranbrook, uh, studying uh, with Bill as one of his first group of students at Cranbrook. So uh, please join me in welcoming uh, our very own Paul Puzello. Thank you, Kevin. I'll keep this short. My working studio at Cranbrook Academy of, uh, of Art was at a location very near the garage door to our apartment department. As I would be awaiting Bill's arrival for critique in a moment of silence, it isn't his voice I would hear uh, first, but the hum of his segue in the distance. Slowly increasing in volume, he would arrive inside the building in a sweep, gliding by my stall like a windrush to park himself in the woodshop. My strongest memory, my strongest memory of this image for me was Bill's essence, confrontational, questioning all sense of convention, embracing innovation and possessing an infectious energy and attitude towards work that affected all of us in the department. 
Bill was always eager to share with us current innovation to a commission he may have, may, have been, may have been working on and was in the trenches with the rest of us competing for workspace. Always full of humor and positive attitude, Bill would do anything for a chuckle. Inhaling helium, balloon helium at fanfare and making a witty observation or explaining a way of looking at architecture relative to his hair gel. These absurdities, ex explaining a way of looking at architecture relative to his hair gel, were absurdities. They were, however, a way of looking at architecture, seeing beneath the surface, almost clairvoyant, observing an underlying condition otherwise obvious to the casual observer. My final year at Cranbrook was Bill's first, and he, was, he wasted no time in reshaping the entire department, physically and philosophically applying his vision. He brought with him his CNC equipment and within a short time, the entire academy from ceramics to 3D design was finding new ways to consider their work through new ways of making. Bill's appointment and tenure at Cranbrook will be one to follow as he takes his sensibilities into an art academy deeply rooted in the tradition of craft and making. As we experience architecture in the realm of digital tools, there's a need to understand its legitimacy to the act of building. We not only need to find potential in these technological strategies, but also appropriation to architecture at all scales and for all purpose, merging design with the craft of making. I'm extremely proud to introduce my teacher and mentor, Bill Massey. Now, this off. I'm going to move this down. Can I move this down? Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Paul, so much. I, um, it's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, hopefully I will uphold my end of the deal and make this uh, kind of entertaining and funny. I, I, I can't, I, you know, it's, um, we're all kind of too serious about all these things. I, as Paul mentioned, I'm very serious about architecture, about what I'm doing, and, and, and in, to think that, uh, that it, almost more than obscure quote that, that Kevin dug up, how serious and how compelling that is, and just how absolutely frightening that must have been to hear at that moment. I mean, that's, that, that, that it's, it's gives me chills to think about that and to think about uh, uh, the foresight and also, and also how radical um, uh, that moment in time was. Um, I'm gonna talk about this, so, you know, our, Kevin and my conversation in the, in the car, and I was talking to Paul uh, uh, from the airport, um, has shifted subtly what I want to talk about. The, the, the images that you're going to see are, are what I thought that I should talk about, um, but I am going to frame it in, 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 a, in a slightly different way, I think. Um, I'm at uh, a little bit of a handicap here because I like to draw, and um, uh, I forgot my stylus for my tablet PC. Um, but oh, so do we have, we have two, two screens. Like two eyes. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about uh, the work reference to practice, and this is something that isn't primarily uh, uh, about the technology, primarily about education, or primarily about anything except for the uh, about what we do and the essentially uh, conventions that that besiege the way we think about making work. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I think that I believe that I'm changing about Cranbrook, and I'll talk about Cranbrook in a minute, is that I'm very fascinated with uh, Cranbrook becoming a place where architects, are, people studying architecture, can actually practice architecture before practicing. Essentially practicing before practicing uh, among a group of peers to kind of hone the thought of practicing. We typically think about in an undergraduate or graduate condition of learning architecture from the kind of ground up through a series of discrete projects, learning structures, professional practice, uh, building construction, all of those things, all of those things which I've actually taught in, 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 at certain points in my career. Um, uh, but fundamentally, I don't know that I had been ever taught about how to form practice how to develop um, uh, a strategy for articulating what I'm fascinated with and making 
the world in large part, uh, attempting to make the world um, even fundamentally a better place. And I, I've learned that through, through practicing my work. And I've really learned it through filtering this technology. Because the technology, if one thing that happens, it, it, it is the ability to uh, essentially uh, 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 think about the construction of your work through the filtering of information. Because obviously we all, all the work, most of the work that we do now is somehow di is filtered digitally. And, and that filtering process, the thing that's fascinating to me is that it crosses obviously all platforms. When my son um, uh, inhaled a Lego and uh, the way they got the Lego, which I won't go into, out of his uh, bronchia um, was entirely a digital process. The way it was photographed and thought about and filtered in a panic situation was, of course, not dissimilar uh, in terms of the filtering mechanism to the way I might conceive of an object, a building, and or um, uh, making a telephone call. I, as Paul knows, as others know, I, I, th I think the last time I saw Kevin and I lectured and I used a lot of Marshall McLuhan video because, because I'm, I'm really fascinated with Marshall McLuhan and I've talked a great deal about him and, and, I, and I won't bore you with that, uh, 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 but I have to say that, that that McLuhan kind of predicted very clearly the conflation of many of these things based on technological uh, 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 condition. Uh, the idea that at one time our culture, uh, because of the flow of information, becomes completely unified and global, that the, at the same time the microscopic or the very, very local becomes extremely important. Um, I think that, that that the ability just to see the way we make or, or make abstraction, at least, being the same as uh, someone in almost every profession that you can conceive of now um, is a significant thing. I, I, I don't mean to draw those parallels that, 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 that potentially those who are fighting global forest fires are architects or using certain kind of digital models. But I think that there are some interesting conditions, like, like the idea that this is, this, this is really one of the simplest ones, that, that a map, uh, that, that there really is no requirement for cartography anymore. I would even suggest that cartography as, a, as an idea is dead. It's, it's no longer significant. Because when you have um, uh, 12 satellites, 24 in total, 12 always in contact with the Earth's surface, in fact, what happens is that there is a virtual world. There's a world which is not based on, on um, a, an industry about uh, rendering that spatial condition and then communicating that. It's actually always active. It's always there. This, this, this idea that, 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 that information is, is, is kind of present and, and, and you're able to just walk over and, and pick that up is amazing. I think that information at one hand, at least for me in my practice, and I really mean this in terms of actually making a building, actually making an object, information is conversational. Uh, uh, and I, I will, through the talk, I'll try to make that clear. It, it's, very, it's very difficult uh, to make it completely clear. I think I can, I think I can pose it, and it's maybe um, uh, like much of my work, I, I, I pride myself more on the, the, the asking of questions than, than the answering uh, uh, of those things. I, I think my, my work hopefully asks questions and it doesn't um, make solution, really. It doesn't really offer direct answers. This project, which I've shown many times, but I'll quickly just suggest the first couple images that you saw was a project in the Big Belt Mountains where I tried to produce a building which would have what I call, um, uh, which would participate in what I call visual rhyming. If you say cat and hat, because those two words uh, rhyme, there's an extension. Not even caring at the moment about what that extension is, but the extension itself between those two words um, reinforces the other word or each other in such a way that it, 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 it develops meaning. It develops meaning audibly as well as, it, as, as a true extension of what cat or hat could mean by simply rhyming. What, how does one do that uh, uh, in a building? Well, this was a, uh, an attempt, successful or not, it was an attempt at, at making a building kind of rhyme 
with the landscape. So the building really wasn't intended truly to be, um, uh, to be camouflage. Uh, that would be hiding something. That would be a kind of much more, uh, I think, difficult, really, uh, um, idea in terms, of, uh, 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 in terms of the making of architecture. To camouflage something it, it was, was, was not the notion. It was really to, to develop a kind of visual rhyme. And through machining, I realized, you know, I knew that I could make curved surfaces, but how could I make those curved surfaces have a relationship not just to themselves, maybe beyond even their potential to hold light? And what I had done is I, I took, um, uh, a lot of people don't know that, that the sinks and some of the other components of the actual building were scaled down GPS survey relationships. The building, if I go back for one second, the building was composed of, um, I had a $6,000 GPS survey uh, uh, that I had at the time. There was no Google Earth, if you can believe that. Um, I, I can't. Uh, Google Earth is like the coolest thing in the world. And I, I heard like on CNN two days ago or something that someone is suing uh, Google because they, uh, they don't want their image. Um, uh, they're, they're on the drive-by piece of software that you can see their house. And what an interesting... Uh, what an interesting problem, but I, I think that, the, that these people are going to lose. I mean, I think that we don't have backyards anymore. I think these things are, are challenged at a certain level. But this house was developed by taking the foreground and background topographies of a GPS survey, which at the time um, I was able to access because of my relationship at Columbia University. It was information that was already there, but, but, but at that point, if you think about it, um, in 1999 or 2000, that information was still guarded at one level because of, uh, for, oh, for many um, obvious reasons. Now that information is, is clear. You know, you just have to get in your big, huge Escalade, you know, with spinners. I, I, I really want like a white Escalade with spinners. But you get in that car and you have a navigational screen, and you have OnStar or something, and you don't really need to have a conversation about where you're going or where you have been. There doesn't need to be a certain kind of reference because the physical world is, is, is filled with so many Starbucks, Home Depots, Lowe's, and everything else that those are, those, those are markers enough. We don't need to know street names. But in fact, you, you, you can find out where you are at, all, at, 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 at every moment. That, that, that physical data manifest in physical form is and was fascinating to me. It's not something which is, um, which, is, which is the directive of the work. It's really, interestingly enough, part of what I'll talk about relative to practice. Um, I'll just use the word practice a lot, so hopefully this will make sense kind of at the end. Um, the building was never really meant as um, as a kind of total device in a strange way. It was, and it is still to this day, a kind of series of discrete experiments where I've talked about many times the idea of spline-based geometry being effectively the equivalent of bending a tube, a, a, a structural, say, I, this is where I like to draw, but I can't draw, I'll do it with my mouse. Um, you know, that, that tube being effectively uh, something that can be bent in one direction and, in the, and bent in another direction at the same time um, it doesn't have a kind of bias towards its integrity. Um, so this, this idea of tube and tube construction um, is something that I'm really, really fascinated with. I'm not so fascinated just with tubes. I'm not so fascinated just, just with the fact that they are the, they are the kind of material basis of spline-based geometry, but I'm fascinated with those things in conjunction to making a building, to making a building that has uh, uh, um, uh, the potential of housing human beings and being a repository for memories. I think of uh, houses, of course, for, for very selfish reasons. Um, that's, the, that's a medium that I'm fascinated with. I'm fascinated with all of the, the kind of theoretical component of, what I'm, of my work, uh, the, the, the kind of experimental, more physical component, but I'm also really fascinated with living. Um, I, I mentioned to Kevin on the ride that, that uh, more and more, and this will become very clear, at, with the last building that I'm going to show you, uh, which is a current building, I'm, I am as fascinated with, um, uh, for instance, n not as fascinated with clients uh, uh, or, or how one specific family lives 
in terms of architecture being service, I'm actually more fascinated with how people live. So how people store their clothes is more fascinating than the way that person wants to store clothes or how they might eat or how they might converse. Um, friends of mine, Scott Marble and Karen Fairbanks, have talked often about this kind of zetgeist or the, or the, 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 kind, of, the kind of other client, which is the, the resale client. Because, you know, we think about um, designing a house for someone and we think completely about those people and maybe trying to make that, that house um, um, uh, do uh, things that they might be very interested in doing, but rather there's a percentage of it that, that, that can't get too specific because, um, you know, people really only live in houses six or seven years or maybe, maybe ten years, and it, that, that's radically shifting. So the idea of, of, of doing a house that is for um, the way people live versus, versus the specific nature of a person I mean, I think that to, to my mind that's fascinating and that reinforces this idea of practice too that I'll get to in a minute, which I know there will be a lot of people in the room uh, um, uh, who find my uh, um, uh, attempt of moving away from, from clients, so to speak, um, as being missing the entire point of architecture. I, 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 don't, I, I don't believe so. Um, uh, I think that in part, the relationship in terms of the power structure of designing and building and financing, all of those things, um, uh, the client is, is a part of that. But for me and the scale of the work that I'm trying to do, um, I'm interested in doing work for kind of, it sounds a little sappy, but kind of all people, not, not, not one uh, uh, person. Um, that being said, of course, most of the work that I've been doing is funded by one person which is, this makes everything that I'm saying a total crock of shit, um, in, in part. Um, uh, but I, I, I know that you're interested in the other part, so I won't talk about the, the part that is a total crock of shit. I, I, I'd much rather talk about buildings and, and about their, their ability to somehow, um, uh, somehow be uh, specific and non-specific as it relates to practice. I did an installation, once again, about bent tubes, but I, I, I mention this because um, I, I, the last project that I'm going to show you is, um, uh, I like to start to think about this project in, as a kind of Monday morning quarterbacking in retrospect, which is it's not quite done, but the project I like to think about it being um, uh, as much about uh, voyeurism as sustainability. It's a kind of a combination between voyeurism and sustainability, which, of course, we all know those things go together perfectly. And there, you know, there are a lot of people who are talking about voyeurism and, and sustainability, you know, like in the Wall Street Journal. And I'm, I'm, I'm teasing, but I, the, 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 this project for PS1, I really was thinking about a, a different form of, of sustainability. I, I, I think that one of the more sustainable things that, that I can talk about is size, and that seems kind of amazing. Where near where I teach at at at, at Cranbrook the houses seem very large, uh, 12 or 15,000 square feet of sheetrock for two people. Um, I, I don't, see, I, I don't understand that. I don't even understand how we got to this place. I think that in part how we got to this place was, um, and, and I, I, I don't mean to offend anyone, but really uh, because um, that entire market and that entire world, that entire scale of architecture is driven by um, uh, builders. Uh, and developers, not really architects so much. Um, uh, and then all of a sudden you put a huge amount of McMansions on the earth and it's kind of logical that that's what people would, would be interested in, in, in having. And I don't really, I guess I don't really fault our culture in that res respect. I, 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 I do um, have a hard time with people talking about sustainable materials but yet building something that's, that's, that's that large for that many people. Um, I, I find that kind of strange. This, when I, when I did the PS1 project, I won this competition, Young Architects competition in New York, and part of it was that I, I had, I won't go into the whole thing, but I had suggested that, um, that I uh, digitize part of Mexico City because the project was Playa Urbana or Urban Beach, and uh, by digitizing that uh, part of Mexico City and then developing a, um, 
uh, a structure that for an entirely different purpose made shade in this parking or in this uh, in this uh, courtyard in New York City that at the end of the exhibition like one would make an exhibition or one would make uh, some kind of provocative um, um, installation that at the end I wouldn't throw all of this PVC pipe away it would go back to Mexico City where the where the topography with a handheld GPS would be able to be redeposited and then it would be sprayed with concrete and it would become part of the permanent structure just to supply shade in Mexico City. Well, um, that didn't happen. Um, I tried to make that happen, but of course uh, it didn't. The first part did. Everyone was more interested in what I had made and what it had looked like, and so I was cool with that. And uh, we, we did it, and it was, it was kind of, a, um, I think, for me, a very successful series of experiments and a successful kind of moment, spatial moment, in, in this project, but um, uh, once again, the thing that was fascinating, most fascinating about it, was that it was a polemic, or the argument was, in fact, I'm going to build this thing by doing two things, taking steel, developing a three-dimensional computer model of the space. That three-dimensional computer model was supposed to be, in part, genetically connected to Mexico City. Take that, import it to this place for an entirely different purpose, to supply shade and comfort in the middle of New York City, and do that by means of laser cutting uh, sections and then running um, uh, running PVC pipe through all of these kind of belt loops. This is this is this is ground that is not necessary to cover, except for you know by making these puzzle pieces, and we did what is effectively. Um, understood as scripting now, um, but we ran uh, a, a basically an overlay part of rhinoceros over all of our parts so that when we, when we cut the parts in part to be able to yield them efficiently, we had a very simple key, puzzle piece, that would bind them together. In so doing, I could weld all of these instead so that these the arcs and, and these relationships were, were jigged. They were just completely clear. It seems silly. I've talked about this for the last 10 years, but I need to mention this one component, which is, which is truly, if that line right here costs 32 cents, let's just say, and it's four inches long, prior to this technology, that same line at 42 inches, if that was equal to that, it cost the exact same amount. Um, that eccentricity, which is what we could have referred to it as, um, what we might even think of as craft, is actually just information. And it's actually, at the same time, um, the importation of what I would refer to as choreography. All of these things underpin practice versus technology. All of these things underpin the act of making as much as what it is that you're making. This is the fundamental difference. This is the fundamental difference that I get kind of pissed off about talking about this technology without talking about it being about practice. It really, to my mind, this is the key. I told Kevin in the car, you know, and I've told Paul this in the past too, I, you know, it's just, I, I have just, I have to get to the point where I'm practicing almost only what I'm preaching. And, and Kevin's right by suggesting that I've given I've given my, myself at one level to this experiment. I, uh, I, I'll show you uh, soon, but I am interested in uh, the restriction of only doing this work this way, um, partially because I believe in it so much, but also at the same time, it gives me enormous pleasure. I love the work, I love these things. I actually physically love to make things myself, and, um, and needless to say, I'm a teeny bit of a control freak, um, not with my students, Paul will attest to that, um, um, but, 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 but when it comes to my own work, yes. Um, the, the ability to actually fabricate something, to move through a series of, of abstract stimulus and then make that stimulus physical is in part, the, the fascinating thing is that I can learn. Um, the, uh, the, the, the distance and the kind of antiseptic nature of what I would suggest is a non-constructed non 
relationship to practice and to making um, um, isn't enough for me. It's not possible for me to learn quickly and well enough. I don't have that good of memory. And I don't have that good of, uh, I, I'm not that, I don't have that kind of um, uh, patience at a, at a certain level. I need to know whether it works, whether it doesn't work, and I need to I need to get through that world quickly so that I can move on. I mean, I think it's I think it's entirely possible to to suggest that part of Wright's genius was because he was able to do so much. When you do though that many houses, for instance, the ability to um, um, if you could remove the ones which were truly experimental that led to ones which which those experiments became in fact not not so experimental but rather poetic. I think that that's in part how these things work. When I did this concrete wall, it was just about the wall. But now when I go back, it's possible for me to mine that idea and that wall. And if there's time at the end, I'll show you this. I, I think some people have seen this uh, experimentation that I'm doing with frozen earth. But, um, and I have a video on that. Uh, but when I do work and when I'm physically making work, it isn't episodic. It's not like I'm trying. I, I'm, I'm resisting this idea of architects, like most architects, OK, I did that. Now I've got to get on to the next thing, get on to the next thing. In fact, the next building that I'm doing after the one that I'll show you is I'm redoing a project that I did which won a PA award. I decided, you know what? Why start with a brand new program? Why not start with something that I already know? I'm just going to redo something that I only did four years ago. Um, that sounds kind of absurd. And I'm sure that I should be cautioned against doing that. But I'm doing it. Um, um, I think that, that, that of course, I'm not going to be reissuing the same building. I'm going to be able to, to, to recast that building in such a way that it fundamentally will be a different building. But I am interested in not one project after the next project after the next project, but I'm, in, I'm, I'm interested in that continuum, which, which is really about practice. OK, that kind of aside. Um, when I got to Cranbrook very recently, uh, this is I've been there. This is my third year there. Uh, I, I I met some people there, and 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 um, they asked me to do a house that I'm collaborating with another architect. I show you this, um, which breaks this one fundamental rule that I've been talking about, which is that I don't like really talking about work that I haven't done, because I am much more interested in what has happened than what will happen, which is which is really a paradigm or a model. At, at Cranbrook that I'm trying to reinforce. This, you know, the idea of like um, uh, my students having a desk crit, I get to be, you know, kind of the, even though I'm not kind of curmudgeon, I, I, I like this idea of very much of saying, oh, well, I'm not really going to talk about that. I, I'm, I'm interested in just being um, kind of like a reporter and a mentor. Uh, so when somebody has done something, then we can talk about what they've done versus um, uh, the, the other colleagues at Cranbrook, you're surrounded with you know, 14 other people. Those people m m really construct what is, in a sense, a de facto faculty. Those people are the people that one goes to about what if. And I'm really in, a, in this position of, of, of um, uh, critiquing what is. Um, so I, I'm breaking a rule here just to suggest that this prefaces um, uh, some of the work that I'm doing physically right now. This was a uh, this is a 14,000 square foot house in Long Island that has a pool that acts as a kind of lighting vessel um, that that moves through the entire building. Terrible. It doesn't show up. It shows up much better on my laptop. But this is this piece that comes down and um, lights uh, this underworld uh, of of below this major plant. This building is not being built in this form. It is. It is, and I will show that at another point. But I, I suggest that this is this is a this is a project where I was fascinated with some um, uh, notions about light, about curvature, and about how one lives. And then I directly associated those into another project, which I'll show you in a minute, which began years ago as a as a client project. But then it it it, it had you know the clients kind of they didn't fire me; they just said. We don't have the money, go away, uh, which is the paramount equivalent of being fired. Um, uh, and then a project that I just finished recently that I've been working around for a bit, it was about three years, 
um, from beginning to end, which is still you know kind of almost too long at a certain at a certain point um, uh, for me uh, because first of all we I built every component of the building with really with two other people. Many people worked on it, uh, but um, but the fundamental aspect of designing it and constructing it was really built by a couple people. And it's a little house, uh, well, not so little, but 2,000 square feet in upstate New York. And these are these are my photographs. They're not such great photographs. It was just published in Men's Vogue magazine, and I was joking, you know, uh, one of the great arbiters of, of good design in America, which is, you know, I, I would ask for a show of hands of um, Men's Vogue magazine subscribers, but I don't want to embarrass anyone. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I don't, I don't really, I don't subscribe to it. But I, I, I'm teasing. The thing that's fast, it's great about it though, is that it sits on newsstands for 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 three months. It's just off the newsstand, but I think it's still online. And actually, I think some of the a, a few images of uh, or or a few images of the the most recent construction that I don't even have on the project that I'm most recently building is on their website as well. Um, uh, they actually own the uh, really nice photographs of this project, which I, I can't uh, afford. So I have mine. But that project, this, the, the Wooten's, Wooten's house, was, um, was built entirely in my shop in Troy, New York, uh, which was a 17,000 square foot building that I bought. And uh, oh, the problem was it only had nine foot high ceilings. So all of the component nature, um, I mean, at, when I think about it now, um, bar none, everything that I've built has been prefabricated, although I, I, I still don't think about it in terms of the, the conversational model of prefabrication. It's just because I'm making things with machines, um, it's easier to assemble them in components somewhere else than to do it in a stick build environment and certainly somewhere where it's not snowing and raining. This, um, you will see, should be viewed, um, this which is horizontal, will be standing up in a minute, and you'll see this. That, that piece is the shower um, uh, for Greg's house, which is that piece right here, which is this piece, which is a 36-foot high shower tower. It's four feet by eight feet at the base, and it's 36 feet high, um, which, allows you to, uh, uh, let me go back, there, if I were to draw over this, there's a 45 degree mirror, so you stand here and that bounces off, um, so you can stand naked in the shower and look over the top of all the little uh, suburban houses uh, that are very, very close by and, and allows you to view um, uh, the Catskill Mountains in the distance. This is uh, an image, so it's floodable, so you can, so I can't draw with my mouse, I can only draw with a pen. Um, um, so you can sit, lay down in this space, look up, and uh, see uh, the Catskill Mountains uh, kind of over the top of these little houses that are there, which is kind of nice. You know, this whole idea about, about practice and about uh, uh, making things and understanding what one makes uh, as being practice is, 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 is clear when an idea like that, which is fun, fundamentally academic or fundamentally, I mean, it's a notion about privacy. It's a criticism of where this privacy takes place and the way we conform to, to the opacity, say, for instance, of a shower. Um, I love showers. Uh, you'll see one in the new building that's, um, uh, I think, kind of a challenging space. Um, uh, partially because it just challenges these kind of fundamental issues of privacy. But this essentially shower turns into, at one level, um, an idea about lighting. So, it, it, so once I made that shower and it's off position um, and it's non-animated or non not being utilized as a periscope, um, it becomes a kind of lighting device. And these things over and over are fascinating. And um, um, uh, they occur to all of us, I think, at one level um, uh, while we're doing it, that this could happen and this could happen. But I'm fascinated with being in a position in my own work to actually, before that building is issued, I get to experience that space and then tune it, like one would just tune a piano before one begins to uh, uh, play 
play music, not really alter the music radically, but tune it. It means so, so very, very much to me. Um, this project, I was really unable to do that at all uh, because uh, it was assembled on, on site, but it was all kind of components built in our space and then trucked from, from Troy, New York. Um, so pieces that were wanted to be kind of together were not able to be together. Pieces that should never have been assembled in the site had to be assembled in the site. Um, uh, many things on and on. Uh, the ability to, um, you know when you specify something, a door, you, you certainly don't think when you specify that door or you begin thinking about the making of a space and having a door open, will the door work? I think that those, I think if will the door work, it, to me is really a challenging idea. It's not a very good economical, economic model to be in a situation of not knowing whether something will work. I don't ever, you know, screw around with those things that could hurt somebody. Health and safety issues, those are less experimented with. Um, but, but things that, 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 that could become uh, promising in the building uh, a need to be experimented with require certain forms of experimentation. In Greg's house, you see it in the article much more than you see it here. They have much better photographs, I think, in a way. Um, but the curtain wall is built with laser cut orange or yellow acrylic, both, and plywood and steel. And we analyzed this uh, quite a bit. And I think I, I was building the prototypes when I moved to Cranbrook. But really, it wasn't. That, so much work went into the structure of that and developing a structurally integral piece of curtain wall which actually held light, but the real goal was to make it hold this kind of light. Um, as, as you know, here in this environment, but also in New England, it seems even more intense, that the coloration of the landscape, especially in this place where the building is, for two weeks, for a solid two weeks, is amazing. It's bright orange and bright yellow. So the color of the sun, the color of the light is, uh, um, uh, is mesmerizing. And I thought that potentially if I could do this and make, and this is something I tried in the Big Belt House, which I didn't show uh, to some success, but to try to have the light move into the structure and be held in the structure, um, could what, what, what would happen? Well, uh, so this literally, if I go back, is a series of quarter inch pieces of laminated acrylic, plywood, and steel, um, which you'll see in a minute a little bit closer to this. It's kind of the principle, though, of um, you know a master lock, the things that you would lock your locker up with that are um, a series of plates versus those cast master locks. Do you know what I'm, you know what I'm talking about? Part, part of the reason is, is that the um, quality, the anisotropic quality of lamination, you know, the, 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 the molecules uh, the structure just in a flat piece of steel is running in a direction. Um, um, you don't really know which direction. It depends on how it was pressed or how it was milled or forged in certain cases. But that's why something like a tennis racket, an old wooden tennis racket or a laminated piece of plywood, that's why it gains its strength because, because the structure, its individual um, spanning strength or its isotropic quality layered in different directions builds strength. So in part, by building a lot of little pieces uh, together, and, and you know, um, I think it's taught me that this can actually be a very, very, very strong um, uh, system to build. What's funny is that the, 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 the kind of ex um, attention span of architectural discourse relative to all these technologies is like every other attention span for architectural discourse which is like 15 to 20 minutes. It's, um, you know, I, I, I know, I know I'm, it's, it, it's about the equivalent of ordering, you know, dinner at Applebee's. As soon as your dinner's over at Applebee's, it, it's kind of, you know, that's over, you know, at a certain level. And the slicing and binding, the kind of bread slicing and cutting, um, uh, everybody, you know, when we all did that years ago, everybody, okay, that's done, let's move on, and, and rightfully so. Um, but but um, I still don't know how many people are thinking about it structurally. Uh, I am in the next project. You'll 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 see all about that. I, I, I find these things. I just find that we 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 go over them kind of too quickly. But this 
this is really just quarter inch plywood and quarter inch acrylic and a strong back of uh, one by one steel. When, when I got the chance to come teach at Cranbrook, I you know, kind of jumped at the chance. It's, a, it's such an amazing institution with um, this very, very strong history. The strong history about craft and the strong history about ideas. But one of the things that, that I, I really thought um, the reason that I would take them up on it and, and, and do this was because, um, not just because of the Department of Architecture, but because it would change my relationship to what I did. Uh, to, to, to take the opportunity to sell my building in Troy, New York, and then recast what I do in an entirely different way. So basically, my time at Cranbrook would be uh, not an extension of my work, but would be rather another level exper of experimentation. And I'll show you what that is. I'll show you the first step in what that is, which is really about, um, um, really, it's about combining all of these things. It's been so difficult to actually make buildings for clients and make buildings for people and be a full-time tenured uh, faculty member who attends every each and every meeting and writes and does all of those things. It's a very, very difficult thing. And crit students, raise children, all of those things. So how, how, do you, how do you do it? This is really what my lecture in, a, in part is about. And it is underpinned by the technology, uh, uh, maybe forcibly, but it is, which is that the ability at Cranbrook to make, Cranbrook is very messy. Um, the boundaries of what is practice and what is teaching are, are, are blurred. The boundaries of, of, of personal space is completely blurred. It always has been and hopefully, as far as I'm concerned, it always will be. This ability um, uh, to have a conversation which, which turns into um, truly a very important discourse, but to be able to have that conversation fold into something um, familial and even. Um, so I, 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 I'm fascinated with, the, with the, um, the fuzziness of the place. And, and for me to be able to sustain my work, it's kind of required. It seems like a logical thing. But, but um, these are some of my students actually uh, working on a project. And this is, the, this is the other kind of crazy part of this, which is that that's the entire size of the School of Architecture. Um, um, if some of the students look older, those are visiting critics. Uh, um, but, but this is the entire, uh, that's, I think that's Paul right there. Hold on a second. That, I think he's looking, with his head cocked like that, he's looking more attentive. Uh, uh, I think, is that you? Yeah. Um, but that's, that's the entire, um, entire department. That has a kind of scale. And it's a kind of level of discourse, which is, which is really very, very fascinating. I'm not going to go into it entirely. But it set me into a situation uh, uh, to look again at my work, which this is my studio right here at Cranbrook, and uh, yeah, right here. And then that's the studio as it stands. And this studio is, is, is in fact, uh, at the end of the Trident Pools. It's such a beautiful, extraordinary place, an extraordinary piece of real estate in a way, um, um, with such incredible history. It's history of which is fairly daunting. Um, this is uh, Charles Ames in that same studio, in my studio. Uh, Charles and Ray Ames uh, uh, made uh, kind of incredible experimentation. I don't know exactly what pieces they conceived of in that space, but it's actually so daunting Quite frankly, it's oppressive. Uh, uh, these incredible uh, designers, architects that have had that space prior to me um, um, is a little bit daunting to my mind. Uh, the place is filled with ghosts in a strange way. And it is fabulous in that regard. So the only way to exercise this is to change where my studio is. I still have that studio. But this really underpins um, um, my work in kind of more, um, um, in really, in, 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 in ways, uh, more logical and more important ways. Um, I sold my building in Troy, New York. I think that this is the point where, I don't know if anybody really knows about this, or not many people do. Um, so I think it's kind of interesting um, to talk about. 
So I sold and I bought uh, uh, about a 14,000 square foot industrial building with a little house and a garage on it on a, on a fairly large piece of property, um, which is really short distance from Cranbrook, where, which is where I'm doing most of my work. And now my students are kind of coming there and I'm going back and forth. But the significance of this is not really in the physical plant, but I, well, you can decide its significance. Um, this is the building right here. And this, from the center of the building, 1,720 feet to that parking spot, um, uh, is, that's Home Depot. So I'm 1,720 feet from Home Depot. And that's to the north and to the south. I'm 1,720 feet from Lowe's. Absolute, the kind of absolute perfect suburban sandwich making. Where I've marked each parking spot um, and I use uh, uh, both Home Depot and Lowe's the way they should be used, which is at, as kind of warehouses, so we don't hold any plywood or hold any spray mount because they're only 32 seconds away from my building. And so I think about it as really they're mine, they're kind of extensions of mine, and I, I, I go through these places as really as, um, as kind of three-dimensional catalogs, and I do have a segue, Paul's right, so I ride my Segway through there, and Lowe's is very uninterested in me riding my Segway there. They, they've kind of stopped me a few times. Home Depot is a little, little bit more liberal about it. I bullshitted Home Depot by suggesting that it was a medical device because you can't have, kids can't have Heelys, or you can't have a skateboard or anything in there. And I, and I, I looked at them straight in the eye and just lied straight through my teeth and said, you know, no, no, I have a bad back, which I do. That's not a lie. Um, um, but, but this is a medical device. And, 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 and the guy said, okay. And so now I, I, kind of, I kind of effortlessly move through the aisles of Home Depot when no one's looking. I actually, you know, I love the place so much I kind of kiss the racks. You know, I, it's, I love Home Depot. You know, most architects hate Home Depot. I love it. I, I, I think I find such value in this place. And I find such incredible value in that it is, um, I, in this project that I'm doing right now, all of the components of the building uh, um, are really linked genetically to uh, McMansions. So many of the products that I'm using find themselves in other ways um, in, in other kinds of buildings. So, so when you look at the building that I'm doing, I, th I think that you probably won't find a McMansion, certainly, um, but you may find um, uh, you know, a kind of um, a wayward child of these places and of these things. Um, uh, needless to say that um, my studio is there and four and a half miles away is Cranbrook. Um, uh, my, my, my studio is really a place for um, uh, you know, things that I can't do at Cranbrook, like build at a larger scale. Antonio is a student of mine and, and he's, I just bought this uh, JCB booming forklift and he's removing the decals so that instead of saying the, the business name on the side, or the company that is the vehicle, it, when the boom extends 35 feet and when it extends fully, it says modernity. Uh, I was just going to talk about my, my children and that relationship too, of being able to have my children as, uh, as kind of um, co-conspirators in all of my work, which I haven't been able to do. It's always been very, very different. I can't have my dog. and and those kinds of things. So I'm really trying and attempting to conflate all of these things that we compartmentalize into one, one profitable uh, venture. Um, and when I bought this building, I thought the first thing I should do is have a party for my department. And, and that's exactly what, what, I, what I did do. It's a really nice space that we ended up uh, renovating um, and then began working on uh, the first project, which is uh, a little prefab house that I'm doing which will be on Cranbrook's campus uh, on display starting May 3rd. So as soon as I leave here, it's a charrette until that time. And I don't know that it'll, every single bit of it will be done, but, but we'll get it close and then it will finish up so that 
If you're interested in coming to see it, you'll be able to see it. It sits right next to the art museum outside. But of course, this is just a section through the shower um, because I don't know why, but I've made the shower the center of the building once again. So uh, uh, this, is, this is part and parcel of its relationship more to voyeurism, but also um, effectively what it does is that it acts as a kind of big lamp. There are two what I call volumetric anomalies, two big bumps in the building, and the building is really a big box uh, uh, with two bumps, and these bumps are lit from the floor, and they develop um, this kind of relationship of, 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 of light. I'll show you in a second. I'm just going to not talk about this here. One thing, just to show you that, that that is this other bump, and that bump is the shower. Um, uh, so I want to just talk about its fabrication, which, which in part, when you look at the fabrication, you may not see anything that you would recognize as being digital. But I think Paul would tell you, others would tell you, that, that um, in large part, every component, even conventional construction, is um, um, uh, kind of, if it's not digitally fabricated from a machine without our hands, it's supplemented. We, I don't believe much in measure. I think that measure is also uh, a form of communication that is somewhat antiquated. I, I believe much more in, um, uh, like, uh, I, I've told this story before that I, I remember hearing on the Discovery Channel, uh, they, built a, um, they, they built a stainless steel rod that, that was held inside of the compartment, the cargo compartment of the third space shuttle. And the reason that they built this was that they could measure everything, but they wanted to empirically be able to understand the balance of the payload and the potential balance of the payload. So they built a stick. And once they were done with the inside of that stick and ran it through expansion and contraction, heating and cooling, they, they, they built the space around the stick, and there really was not, at the end of the day, um, a, a dimension, a number that was communicated. It was rather, it must be this big. And so oftentimes we are producing those kinds of things. It's a, it's a structural steel frame uh, uh, building, a uh, little building, that has um, structural insulated panels, SIPS panels, that are uh, placed inside of of the, of the building, and basically the SIPS panels really don't do anything except for supply some diaphragmatic strength. When I engineered the building, I engineered it basically as a frame without uh, uh, that. So, so, so the, the diaphragmatic strength or the, the shear strength in, in, in many components of the building is really just safety factor beyond the steel. But um, uh, the, the SIPS panels were all uh, machined from our CAD work by um, uh, two companies in Michigan, and um, uh, they both have large computer numerically controlled milling machines. I, I'm, I'm sure um, um, this, this technology is here uh, uh, all around. Uh, th those, in this case, uh, those panels were, I think, you know, within a sixteenth of an inch tolerance. But all of the interior components, we built plywood jigs and and laser cut full templates in in um, uh, in cardboard to fundamentally understand exactly um, uh, how big something was going to be, study that, and then harden it in a way. That seems that seems really um, exotic, uh, but it's not exotic um, uh, if you have all of that equipment, if you own all the equipment, and you are there every day. Uh, doing the work, it's just rather um, a matter of fact. Um, that's exactly how I'm trying to work. The, I'm trying to construct my practice so that other people answer the phone, other people do those things. And my practice started to get to the point where um, I was, you know, essentially uh, one half of my day was answering email and paying bills and putting out fires, and I have no interest in that. And I did, I just, I just couldn't believe that I found myself um, realizing that that was the trajectory of my life when I had spent um, uh, 10 years in education, being educated and, and educating as well, talking about something entirely different. That just wasn't it. So how do I, how do I, how do I change it so that 90% of my day is what I was educated to do, which was to basically own everything. That was, 
That's the great American idea. Own the building, own the equipment, own everything, and then actually own the whole project and process entirely until I put it up for sale. The way that people did, mostly builders, that have constructed, I think, the suburban landscape, which is um, really very, very problematic in America, it, 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 where we have um, size over significance constantly and just yards and yards of sheetrock. It's just, to me, it's a devastating and it's absolutely, it's absolutely problematic. I think that we're going to find with, with, with the current relationship of the environment and with the current uh, downturn in the economy, uh, um, it, these house, many of these houses won't even be, be, have two occupants, they'll have no occupants, which, which I don't think anybody designs for. Zero occupants is probably not, a, not, a, not, a, not an objective. Um, uh, drainage pipe from, from Home Depot um, becomes, at one hand, uh, a ways away at what Kevin was quizzing me on about, does this building that I'm doing have a site? It, it does, but it's not a real site. The site is light, and the site is a position on Earth. So there's a direction of south, and there's, and there's, and there's a direction of north in terms of a view. And then these kind of apertures, these elliptical windows, these apertures really just then recontextualize that light in a place. So of course the building would be different anywhere. Um, it's just a little two bedroom. These are all construction shots. You'll have to see the thing in person to, 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 to view it. But, but, um, but the walls in two, on the two opaque sides actually um, increase and decrease and hold light in a certain way. This is where, uh, sorry, this is, there's actually a, a bed here, um, a bed here so that you can kind of look up and through that window to see um, what it's like outdoors. Um, all of the components that we, that we um, designed, in large part, we, we built. We didn't build, obviously, toilets and certain kind of UL-listed light fixtures and those kinds of things. But any time we could get away with um, composing it ourselves versus composing it by, um, by um, specification was, in fact, uh, what we tried to do. Not just, I used to do that stuff from a kind of purely academic model of just saying, I wanted this, you know, the Big Belt House, I've said this many, many times before, we built the entire thing with no drawings, um, and that was the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life. We, we had laptops with uh, towels and sheets over our heads on site because the sun was too bright, um, uh, uh, assembling uh, puzzle piece foam that we would then pump with concrete um, with no verification set of drawings. I, I wouldn't do that again. But drawings are really, um, once again, they're kind of, for me, conversational. The real, the real core information is in the stimulus or is in the information. They're just a way to communicate between two people. They are no longer the data. Um, they are no longer, for me, the legal document. I've eliminated that whole process. Um, I just went through the city of Bloomfield Hills. Um, I brought this to the city of Bloomfield Hills and I said, you know, there are no construction documents, but I'll show you all of my shop drawings and all of my engineering and all of my calcs based on the steel frames that went to a, a different fabricator, and it, they said, okay. Um, so we did, we did drawings which were, in the past, I had done those drawings, I probably shouldn't say this, uh, uh, to BS a little bit, um, the building officials, so that they wouldn't know how kind of strange it was, or interesting it was, whichever way you want to think about it, or how unconventional it was, because you know many of these, uh, of these, of these, um, criteria are based on convention, um, and convention becomes the currency for acceptance. And uh, in this case, I just made drawings of what the building was, and then I showed them all of the other data, um, uh, which was, I think, clear. The, this, is, this is actually, you know, in, in a way, once again, this red slicing, uh, um, these are all structural insulated panels that we cut out, machined in part, sometimes bandsawed them, whatever we needed to do, and then the perimeter on the top, bottom, and the sides is all steel. So that it's kind of like if I were to, um, I, it's going to be hard to draw, but a boat, if that's a boat, like that, that skeleton of a boat, um, all of the infill is lightweight and extremely strong once it's all laminated together. 
but the frame around the outside is steel. So, so, so the, the shell really is only, only surprise diaphragmatic strength. Um, and this is, a, this is a view looking down on, uh, on the uh, shower. Um, I, I, I pro I, I've never explained it this way, but I should probably explain it now um, um, because I think it's probably a little bit easier. So you understand what you're looking at. You're looking down. This is actually ends up being a skylight. That's the bathtub in the house, and that's the door into the shower. The shower is uh, 14 feet by five, about 5 feet wide um, uh, by 10 feet tall, and there is a skylight over this space. Um, uh, maybe I'll, I'll go, sorry, I'll go on and... Um, and that's kind of looking into the space itself. And it gets urethane foam on the inside, and then it's being um, uh, really traditionally plastered. Um, um, that's me spraying foam. Yes, I'm wearing a, a Lacoste shirt because that's how I roll. Spraying foam, you know what I'm saying? Um, uh, anyways, uh, sorry. The 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 thing that's that I love desperately is the ability to um, uh, test uh, because this is this component of practice, which is underpinned by having the equipment by by making something and and unmaking it and then making it and then cataloging very clearly, having it etched in your mind not to do it that way the next time. Even though it works perfectly, still there's a reason not to do it that way or to move on and have the work be um, experimental at its basis but um, transitional, meaning it, I, all of that information that I'm learning, I'm trying to bring to bear. I, I have tested, much like some of the work that's being done here, um, in terms of digital fabrication um, and much of the work of many of my colleagues around the country testing in a kind of episodic way this thing, this thing, this thing, this thing. These are all really fascinating but to me the, the real power comes in when you take that information, move to that point of resolution and then roll it over into something else and then roll that over into something else and roll that over into something else to the point where, you know, when you think about stick framing a building, there's very little rolling over anymore. But imagine how the 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 how eloquent and how amazing and how efficient stick building a suburban house is. It's fantastic. It's like it's 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 absolutely beautiful. I mean, it's not the kind of work that I'm interested in doing, but it is really very much. Um, um, uh, uh, it's it's amazingly efficient, amazingly. Uh, beautiful at one hand. I, the other thing I'm always doing, like I showed in the beginning, and I've done it in Greg's house and in every other house, I like to build sinks. I like, for some reason, this notion about vessels. Obviously, part of the reason that I love these things is because I can physically make them, and I can make them, and, 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 and the sink is something that you go to a catalog or to a showroom or to Home Depot or something, and you're just kind of given the sink, and it has so, so much presence um, and I think about sinks as being um, a kind of um, smaller scale vessel than like a, a bathtub or a shower is a little bit larger vessel and, and, and you know, but obviously uh, much bigger than something like a glass that you could carry and hold. These sinks, um, this is what they will look like. We haven't cast them yet. I was just saying we're going to do that this week. They're, they're cast in um, a, uh, an amber rubber. I just put this in there because um, Turnstone, which is a company that I've collaborated with in the past, they're actually building some of the cabinets for this stand-up office that I'm doing, and I and I and I and oops, and I I wanted to just suggest that, you know, Brian, who's a guy that I work with, who um, uh, Paul knows and was one of my students when I was teaching at Montana State, we've been working together for about 10 years. He's just such a kind of digital, um, um, he's just so good, you know, and and he's able to make image. Um, uh, which we have to fight against constantly because it took, I remember, it took one hour, after I had designed this, it took one hour to kind of like make it completely real visually. And, um, and I think that it will have taken, in part, 100 hours to fabricate and manufacture this. So, so it, 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 this, this, this idea 
that the fabrication of these things is somehow um, uh, uh, somehow separate from the goal to me is 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 literally not the case. Um, I don't have any more images of this, so I, I forgot to tell you about sustainability and voyeurism, and then I'm going to wrap up here. But so, so let me just bounce back to that idea for a second. All the windows, or not all of them, but many of the windows below um, uh, actually um, are operable. And uh, those windows open up, but then the skylight in this piece, which is the um, shower, what we affectionately refer to as the coconut, the, the doors open in the coconut in the shower, and then the skylight opens so that you can open all of the low windows and then as a kind of chimney effect, evacuate all of the air through the shower. But if you go and, um, you go and grab a latte and it thunderstorms, um, when, which is right about the time you want to ventilate the house anyways, um, it's okay because it'll just rain into the shower. Um, you know, I, 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 I like that idea. It's a, it's a kind of, um, you know, Glenn Murcott meets David Lynch idea or something. I, 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 oh, by the way, you uh, just one added thing which is much more significant than, than the rest of what I'm going to talk about for the students. If you, um, if you go to um, YouTube and you type in David Lynch, who's my favorite filmmaker, and you go to David Lynch iPhone, I don't know if anyone's seen this, you'll see um, uh, a hero of mine um, articulate or drop the F-bomb in the most beautiful way you've ever seen in your life. Uh, it's really, it's really worth seeing. You've got to check this out. This is just um, in a model laser, which is uh, a very expensive, like a three quarters of a million dollar um, uh, five by ten laser that I'm trying to get right now. Be, but the, but the major thing is, and I don't really have much evidence of this beyond some of the PS1 stuff that I showed and some other little tests, which is that it's linked to an Amada um, break. So what, what one can fabricate two-dimensionally and laser cut um, directly is associated and recorded in the break so that you can dimensionalize that in kind of one move. There is a mediating kind of robot between the two. And then, of course, you probably know this stuff. I'm, I'm trying to buy um, a YUM a tube bender, which is a computer numerically controlled tube bender. Of, you can take a 20-foot um, uh, tube. It can be rectilinear or round in section, and then just press out the shape, um, uh, and it's, it's extraordinary accurate within, you know, kind of an eighth of an inch. Um, I think that's probably good enough. Thanks very much. But I can definitely take questions if anyone still is interested. Any questions? Yeah. It's I, every single time I do work, I'm amazed at how right I am and how wrong I am at the exact same time. My guessing, my intuition is dead on, but then um, um, problematic at the same time. We were, we were driving through uh, Indianapolis today. We saw a, uh, a crane lifting some HVAC equipment, and I had Paul stop because the way they were picking up the, that, inf that stuff um, was something that uh, I struggled with. I mean, literally, I conceive of ways, I have to conceive of the way to pick it up and put it down and transport it and all of those things. Because if I don't, it doesn't become uh, very reasonable. It's also why the next building after this one that I'm working on, in, among friends, the largest component of which is exactly the same as the other one. It's, it's like, I. I experimented this way with tube steel and, and, and stress can panel. I feel like I have to do another one this way because I've learned so much. I want to apply that immediately. The, 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 the more poetic aspect of the building is a totally different thing.
but the structure, the fundamental structure, is, is going to be very, very similar. But hopefully, I would guess, maybe a third more efficient because of the learning curve. You know, this is the thing that's very funny. A friend of mine, we were talking about it, and uh, you know, I think my clients have, in the past have not felt this way or anything else. But I realize now, this, is, this would be the seventh building uh, that I've actually built. And I didn't show, I'm building three projects right now in the Caribbean that are these three pavilions. And um, uh, I only said yes to that project because they're arch architecturally they're not, to, to my mind, I shouldn't say not significant, but they, they, they're, they're limited. But um, I said yes if I can build them all uh, because I want to experiment with their construction. And, and I did and it worked out really well. It, it, it gave me the ability to really look at how to build these things. My point was that I, when I was having drinks with a friend, I realized after, you know, I've, I've built seven modern buildings. And my friends in New York who I hang out with and my friends in Michigan and around the country, they, their contractors have typically not built seven modern buildings. They've built a great deal of this and a great deal of that. Or if they are modern buildings, then they're commercial contractors. So it's funny that, that um, um, I'm starting to know a lot about building. And that's really, that's really, it's really helping a lot. But I would never suggest that I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just constantly learning, which is, which is really, that's the whole notion of practice. If I can be in a situation where, where um, I'm learning instead of issuing. Uh, this might just be a small little question, but um, with the uh, PVC tubes that you use as windows, um, what motivated the location or the size or the the angle of those different those different windows? Uh, were you going for a particular effect or? Yeah, you know, um, uh, Kevin's seen this. I, I've lectured almost exclusively on that PS1 project, but in a nutshell, really quickly, the the diameter was given by the cheapest longest PVC pipe that I could buy, which was an irrigation pipe. Uh, it's not a Schedule 40. I can't remember the name of it. It's a, it's, it they're 22-foot uh, lengths each piece with a male and female bell on the end. And then um, uh, the, what we did is we took chalk, my son's chalk, uh, and chalked out my driveway into a perfect grid and then bent that exact pipe um, in, in um, actually uh, really uh, well, I, guess, I guess I can't do it I can't do it here but there's nothing to oh yeah I, if I could draw it I would draw it but um, uh, there's nothing to draw with there basically you know in, in spline based geometry if I take a straight line and I bend it but I bend it asymmetrically on that on the total spline itself the length the back of it will bend slightly. It has a kind of um, uh, material resistance. So basically we bent two directions, or, or one direction, but asymmetrically the PVC pipe and then wrote, had someone else write a C-hook program, uh, basically a patch program in Rhinoceros, which would only allow us to bend with that physical imported uh, property into the computer. Subsequently, then in Rhino, you can still do this. You can see stress and strain deformation. There's a, there's, a, there's a part of Rhino where you can see it turns red or blue based on how much something is bending. And that's how we developed uh, the, the whole space, the limitation of that particular thing. But what we did was decided to choose, we chose the material first, and then imported that into, uh, uh, into that. We're doing with a finite uh, element analysis software, which doesn't tell you, if you've ever worked with those softwares, my God, there's, I mean, you know, I am certainly not a rocket scientist, anything but. Um, uh, but, but, it, but in fact, it, it's, it's, it's so difficult, uh, uh, at least for me, uh, and, and the versions that we've had. But we, we imported our own understanding of, um, of eighth inch strength in in tension and in bending of a certain size. So then we, we, we've done that again and said, the way we're going to begin engineering is by deciding what it is, uh, what the physical thing. That's an, interesting, that's an interesting thing. It is kind of, to my mind, like thinking about 
GPS condition, where, where, where you're kind of sourcing the actual. Um, but, but the way you're doing that is through very, very uh, complicated digital processes. Versus, versus seeing what you can do with a machine, uh, thinking about what is possible with a material, and then going backwards. Yeah, I'm sorry. I should have I should have talked about this. N well, no. Um, okay, so here's the here's the quick version of it. I had designed the Big Belt House, the first project that I showed, that was all a series of um, um, bread slice pieces of of um, of Shuskin panel running the same running the long way of the building. I built big section of it, a 12 by 18 foot physical section of it, which I've showed, talked about before. Then I ran out of money. Um, uh, I didn't have the money. And then one of my prize students, uh, I, fantastic students at the time, um, was a guy named Ki uh, uh, Shinya Kitano from uh, Tokyo. And um, he was working with me. And he had just talked about Toshiga Ruban's work. And I went to New York, and there was a show at Toshiga Ruban. I said, well, God, you know, why can't I do this like a bunch of um, bamboo? And I thought, you know, ah, what's the American version of bamboo? PVC. <laughs> you know, of course, right? Um, it's polluting. And no, no, but, but um, and then we quickly, uh, uh, because we were shut down, we built that, we built all the concrete, a big, huge whale skeleton sat after the first summer. And then the next summer, we went out to try to skin it. And I was going to machine all of that in the winter. I ran out of money. We did a bunch of tests in my studio, and a simple thing, like your hair. Um, I won't talk about hair gel. Um, but, but the ability to turn, to bend it in one direction and up at the same time, two directions, became clearly interesting. And so the entire Big Belt House, that whole 200-foot roof wall, is all PVC pipe sprayed with urethane foam as a kind of um, insulation, and then gun iron. So, so it became a kind of matrix. And then I did this other house in Montana. I showed, uh, I didn't talk about it that way, but I showed one image of that house. And in all the cases, um, um, these very complicated forms that we could rationalize in the computer were made by stringing PVC pipe, connecting the dots of PVC pipe. And then, of course, I built two buildings that that material is completely buried in the inside of the buildings. It's just you know it's just in four and a half inches of thickness, um, um, and becomes a kind of substrate. And in PS1, I decided to, uh, uh, to to articulate it. Yeah, obsessions are obsessions a really useful thing I think. Yeah, I, 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 I spent so much time at Home Depot, you can't believe it. And I, 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 you know, like, on my way home, if I've had a couple beers, I go there. I just, I just, you know, I absolutely love it. And people ask if they can help me, and I smile. You know, it's, okay, you know. Um, not, you know, I really do. I love it desperately because I, I, I do exactly what you do, which is to go there. I really think of it as a kind of three-dimensional catalog. I look at it to look at the stuff. Um, and I've mentioned this before. You know, when I first built anything, the first thing I really ever built, the building, first building that I, I tried to build myself, I would go to lumber yards, and you would, get, you would look at ply, or the, uh, you'd have to go in, and there's a guy with a kind of thick neck or something, sitting there and he'd, and he'd say, oh, can I help you? And I'd say, yeah, I want to buy three pieces of plywood. And he'd say, what kind? And I'd say, I don't really know. He's like, well, what do you want? Do you want CDX, AB, blah, 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 all this kind of shop talk. And I'm like, you know, what I'd really like is, could I just touch it? Would it be possible? I just would like to look at it. Um, you know, it, it, we, it, and, and Home Depot really um, blew that world apart, you know. They, Home Depot de demystified construction. 
at, at one hand, not just for people who do it professionally, certainly maybe it didn't, but it did for homeowners. And it demystified the construction industry that, 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 that counter conceptually that was there is no longer there. So you can go there and just think and look at it. Yeah, I, I, I intentionally use things on purpose, not in the way they're supposed to be, just because I feel like it's kind of an obligation in a strange way. I have a question. Um, are you ever interested, uh, I don't know, think I've ever heard you explain this, but, and it may be relative to scale, but do you, and I see your, your work kind of staying in this relative scale. Um, and I know it's certainly possible to go beyond it, but what, do you have interest to do larger scale work or go on beyond the, um, maybe the domestic condition to you know, you know, explore uh, other kinds of programs? No. I, every, it's for everybody else. I think, you know, you know, part of the reason is I did. And, and I'm not saying that I would turn down a small airport uh, on a beautiful island somewhere. I would, okay, I'd like to do that. You know, uh, yeah, but the thing is, is that I don't, I, I don't, I can't sacrifice what I'm doing. So I just, I just, uh, I'm doing one project. And once again, many architects, I think, would find this, you know, terrible. But um, I'm not doing the CDs. I am going to be the architect of record, but I'm not doing CDs. I'm not doing a lot of that work because I don't want to change my practice. I love my practice, and I can't get it to the point where it takes me over me, which is the which is the issue. So, the scale is not. This is a tw the one I'm putting at Cranbrook Rate is 2,600 square feet. Politically, I'm interested in building houses being not much bigger than that. That's my own take tactic. Um, uh, my space, my building, I can fit an entire 27 square foot, 2700 square foot building in one room and pick it up with my crane and turn it around and shake it and do whatever. So I can test at that scale. All of these scales are coming to bear. I had a chance in Detroit to buy a 100,000 square foot beautiful building. And it was like, what am I ever going to build that's that big? I don't really have a, an interest. And once the scale of the proposition gets so large, then I should be doing architecture conventionally. So that scale, I love the idea. I am more than um, interested in the idea that I don't do anything, at least for the next 10 years. This is just a, a line in the sand that I can't make in that building. I love that restriction. I love the idea that, sure, I'll do something for a client or whatever, but I'm going to do it in this building, and then we're going to take it out later, and I'm going to figure out that, because I just want to be I want to go every morning to my space and do my work in that building and clear the docks and, 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 and do that kind of work. So the scale is really based on, on, on that place. Special assistance needed in architecture. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up with one last question because Josh is jumping out of his seat, right? <laughs> is that right? It is. It, well, if it's coming from you. Go, go right ahead. Shifting in scale in the other direction, you've, you've talked about vessels like sinks and things like that. I mean, surely you've thought about how uh, some of these products become commodities in these smaller scale things. Am I crazy? What, is there any, any plans there like on, on how to? Yeah, I mean, you're not crazy, but don't call me Shirley. <laughs> but I love that. I'll just. <laughs> Um, uh, no, I think that um, I think that I think that other ways of supporting one's work. Uh, uh, I think it's I think it's totally viable. I really love buildings. I, I have to say, um, um, you know, with all of the people or a couple of people from Cranbrook who are here, um, um, if they plug their ears for one second, then I'll tell you something. No, I'm teasing. It's just that you know there is a kind of vibe, and there has been a vibe that at Cranbrook in the past to some degree. What I'm really interested in is doing um, is becoming a studio artist, doing installations. I just I remember um, I I knew I know um, Liz Diller and Rick Scafidio and other people in New York very very well, and it always was. In, in, a, in a way, um, somehow students get the idea that doing installations 
would be what they were going to do as a life's goal. I've done so many installations. I've done two, I've won two projects, I've done installations. Those are just because I can't do buildings. I mean, I, I, the only reason I would only do furniture is because I can't do a building. I, I'm, I, 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 love, I like objects, I like playing tennis, I like, you know, I, but I really like buildings. And, 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 and I, think that, I think that all of the, all of the, the experimentation I could bring to bear, and I have, um, in furniture. I'm actually producing three pieces of furniture for, for, the, for the building, but, you know, those pieces are going to make sure, I'm making sure that they come after the building is done. I mean, I, I, it's so difficult to do buildings. Um, 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 the transportability of furniture and those kinds of things, um, it's, it's fantastic. It's probably a much smarter way to make money and to, and to get your work out there at a certain level. Uh, but I, I really like uh, uh, making uh, buildings. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you.